Okay, and we're off again. So lecture 1B, and this is a, a kind of sweep through the history, ultimately of computer games, but actually of, of computers themselves in some ways. Okay, so here we go. All right, a history of computer games, or as it literally says there, a star history of computer games. That's not a reference to the A star root finding algorithm, although we will be looking at that later. Um, the star is just an asterisk to let me make a qualification that this history will be hugely biased and selective based on my own personal interests, <laughs> but then aren't all histories. Um, so let's start by talking about a guy called Charles Babbage. How many of you are familiar with Charles Babbage? Okay, so I've got well, it's not, about five hands out of the kind of 35, maybe slightly fewer. <laughs> Have I lost people already? My God. Um, <laughs> never mind, these things happen. Uh, so a small fraction of you, but by no means everyone. And that doesn't surprise me because I've asked this question in the past and Babbage appears to be not terribly well known. But that in itself is a kind of meta surprise because if you don't know who Charles Babbage was, that sort of means you don't know who invented the computer. right? And as I asked earlier, you're almost entirely computer scientists and you're not first year computer scientists, you're second, third year, fourth year computer scientists. And I'm afraid you don't know who invented the computer. Now, it's, don't worry about it, it's not your fault. It, it, it hasn't been taught to you because computer science is a weird subject that seems to not really care much about its history. So you just don't get taught this stuff. It, may, it sometimes comes in incidentally in some other subject. You occasionally get a mention of it, but uh, it's generally not part of what you get taught. But I think it's a little bit strange. I mean, if I was a computer scientist, which I am technically, um, and I was trying to say, well, you know, what's my subject? What are the questions of this field? What are the things I would like to know? You kind of make a mental list. What would, I, what would I want to know about this thing that I'm learning? And you'd kind of write them down and think about them. I think who invented the computer would be quite high on that list. <laughs> so not only have you not been taught that, you've also never asked the question to the point of typing it into a search engine. It's not like it's hard. When I was a student, it was hard. If I wanted to know things, I had to go to the library. Right. All you have to do is type it into Google. And in fact, literally, if you go to Google, or even better, DuckDuckGo, and you say, uh, who invented the computer? You'll see you get mathematician Charles Babbage, Charles Babbage, Charles Babbage. In fact, the Google one is actually, uh, I'm not the world's biggest fan of Google for various reasons, but if you ask them who invented the computer, there you go. It's, it's sort of a boom. OK, so that's who Charles Babbage is. Um, an interesting person. So um, in these slides, uh, the, the blue things are, are links. So when you're looking at this yourself, you can click on those and follow them. So if you open this link here, it takes you to the Wikipedia page so you can follow up. And in fact, this week, uh, especially because there's no programming homework yet, your homework this week will just be to review these slides uh, once I've posted them to you and to go through and follow the links and try and just do a bit of the background reading. It's, you know, it's not a huge amount, and you might find it interesting. You'll learn some stuff that I'm not going to talk you through directly. So that's one of the things you can do. The other thing about the slides is I should mention that when you're playing through them, if you press escape, what will happen is it zooms out to like a, an overview that allows you to navigate them. You can use the cursor keys to page in and out. And I've organized it into columns, where a column is a, a bunch of related ideas, roughly. So you can play with that later. Um, OK, so that's the Wikipedia thing for, for Babbage. And here's a, a bit of extra info again that I would, I would suggest you try and look at in your own time. Um, you can get a bit of the, the history of how all this uh, came to be. Uh, uh, so you can have some fun with that. Uh, now, so I've just told you that, that Babbage sort of invented the computer. That's, that, that's kind of the standard answer. The truth's always a bit more complicated. Um, the caveat with Babbage is that he didn't actually complete his inventions in his lifetime. So he didn't leave a working computer behind. So, you know, does that count or not? You can kind of slice these things various ways. But he's quite widely considered to be the inventor of the computer, even though the type of computer he made was actually a mechanical one. So it's totally different technology to, you know, the, the electronic ones that we have nowadays. But the point is that the machine was capable of the same sort of operations as a modern computer. So it was uh, uh, in, the, in the kind of, in the sense of Turing completeness, if you know about that, that his was a was a Turing complete machine, uh, so it, it stands. It, it's a, it's a, he has a valid claim, even though you can dispute the details. So that's Babbage. Um, another person of interest from a similar period is Ada Lovelace. How many of you have heard of Ada Lovelace? 
Yeah, uh, definitely more than Babbage, right? Uh, I think more than half of you. And that's a change that's happened recently as well. Ada's become quite well known in recent years. There's, you get, kind of see articles about her quite a lot. And there's a thing called Ada Lovelace Day that's kind of used to celebrate women in computer science. And I think that's why she's become like a more... Hello, yes? Yeah, we also have like a female-centric uh, computer science group here. Uh-huh, right. And not computer science, like all... Uh, like, Engineering. Right, program, okay. And that's called ADA. Right, ah, cool. I should maybe just repeat that because I know that things that a student says might not be picked up by the mic. So okay. I'll just point out that what you had said there was that uh, within the university you've got a, a group for female computer scientists or engineers or whatever. Yeah. And it's called ADA, yeah. named after her. So that would explain why you, you know that name as well. And they're, they're both interesting people. Uh, but it turns out Ada Lovelace and, and Babbage were. Um, Colleagues, I suppose you would say, they actually worked together on the design of the, the first couple of uh, attempted computers back in the olden days. So what I'm going to show you here, this is a little uh, comic strip that was made a few years ago um, by a, a woman called Sydney Padua, who's really good. And this is her little comic book introduction to Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage. So just because I can't think of another way of doing it, I'll just read it out to you as we're paging through it, um, and you'll see where it's going. So this is Charles over here. And that's Ada working away on her uh, notes. And uh, Charles says, Greetings, people of the future, which is you. Uh, perhaps my name is familiar as the inventor of lighthouse signal lights, tree ring climatology, or the penny post. But if all was gone as I planned, I shall be known as the creator of the difference engine, this thing over here. So the difference engine was one of the two big computer designs that Babbage came up with. The difference engine was the, the kind of first one. And then he did a fancier one called the analytical engine. And they are the kind of historical early computers. Uh, Babbage is actually a very famous man in his day. He did all sorts of things. He didn't just do computers. He was like a, a very well-regarded mathematician. And uh, he, he made all sorts of inventions and, and wrote a great number of things. He was a very uh, interesting figure. Um, and here he is, Charles again. Unfortunately, this mere fragment is all I have been able to complete. That's sort of true. He didn't. He designed the machine, but he couldn't build it to completion, in part because, well, it was just difficult, but also the, the, the machinery had to be done to very high precision standards to make sure it would work. It was all clockwork, right? It was all cogs and gears and stuff. And Babbage had trouble with the guy he hired to build it for him. They kind of fell out with each other, partly over money and uh, various other things. Babbage tended to fall out with lots of people. He was quite irascible. Uh, so it was a complex story. But anyway, uh, unless I am able to secure further funding, the course of science would be hampered by slow and error-prone human computers. This is a subtlety I should point out to you, that when, when we use the word computer nowadays in English, we, you know, it means modern digital electronic computer. But if you go and read some stuff from the olden days, like when I was researching some of this stuff, I would be reading things from the 1800s, and you'd occasionally read articles in, in, in newspapers or, or booklets talking about how there were 30 computers working on some problems. What? What, in 1840? But that's not what it meant. The word computer back then was a job description. A computer was like a person who was employed to do calculations for a living, like a clerk you know, or like an accountant, right? So they did, in fact, have computers in the 1800s, which was like a room full of uh, people doing arithmetic all day, uh, and that's what computers were. But they made mistakes, right? Because it turns out one of the things these groups of computers would do is they'd be calculating mathematical tables, like tables of you know, sign and log and all these things, but also uh, navigational tables or astronomical tables that were used for navigation. So these tables were, were actually very important. They would be used to work out your position at sea because of the whole problem about working out your longitude, which is like a big historical difficult problem. Um, and, and a lot of it was done based on taking like, astronomical observations and various mathematical calculations you had to do and figure it all out. And it was all done by just big books full of computed numbers. And it turns out when you check them, a lot of them are wrong. And, you know, this could cause problems, like serious problems, like, you know, your ship would crash. You'd end up in the wrong place or you'd end up not on the land and you'd run out of food or something. Right? So it was, a, it was actually a huge problem that these calculations were not being done reliably. And that's why Babbage invented the machine. That's what he thought computers were for. Um, so he says, I have faith that in your time, all these calculations will be done by steam. Uh, by which he meant that his mechanical machines, they would be powered by a steam engine like everything else. So there'd be somebody, you know, shoveling coal into one end of it and uh, generating steam, and that would be turning the mechanism to make his machine work. 
And here's a prediction that this is this, this won't be an exact quote from Babbage, but this is very close to the kind of things that Babbage really said. The day will come when every capital city will have an engine at the disposal of men of science and women uh, printing large tables of numbers entirely without error. And that's what he thought computers were for. And he tried to get the British government to help fund this effort for him. That was one of the problems that they kept giving him money and he kept not quite finishing the machine and then saying, well, I need more money uh, back and forth. And then it's like, are you going to pay for this? Or am I paying for this out of my private fortune? Because he was, he was rich. Uh, it's a complicated story. Now, here comes Ada. Uh, and this thing here actually is a direct quote from Ada from a very famous paper that she wrote where it's considered to be the first real paper in computer science where she's describing the engine. So Ada said, uh, it might act upon other things besides number where objects found whose mutual fundamental relations could be expressed by those of the abstract science of operations and which should be also susceptible of adaptations to the action of the operating notation and mechanism of the engine. Now, that was kind of the style that paper was written in. I think that's wordy, right? <laughs> that's, you didn't need to say it like that. But, but the way kind of Victorians wrote, there was, you know, there was this tendency to be kind of a bit pompous about stuff. Basically, the, th the thought she's giving there is that if you had a computing machine, it wouldn't just be able to do arithmetic insofar as the things that you're doing arithmetic on could be, if you could imagine them corresponding to other things, like if those numbers represented colours rather than really just being numbers, then the arithmetic that you're doing would count as manipulating colours in some sense, and you could do something that wouldn't seem like maths, but it is maths, really. And, of course, with real modern computer games, that's what we're doing, right? It's all math under the hood, but it looks like pretty pictures and sounds and stuff. Um, and also, it's funny that she mentioned things like objects and stuff like that. You know, the modern reader looks at it and thinks, oh, object orientation ahead of its time. Not quite what she was getting at, but it's, it's pretty cool, though, that that was written in, like, 1842 by someone who'd never used a computer because no one had actually built one yet. <laughs> right? So it could be used to create music or images, for instance. And again, that's a direct quote from, from Ada. And then Charles comes in, and large tables of numbers, of course, which he felt was the, the primary, the, the, the honest use of a computer is to create tables of numbers. Uh, so that's indeed from Notes on the Analytical Engine. And uh, Babbage, yes, Babbage did have huge collections of tables of numbers, and he would go through them with his friends and recalculate parts of them to work out how many errors there were, uh, so that he could go to the government and say, these tables are all wrong, you need to pay me to build a computer to do it properly. It's a great story. Uh, and now, prepare to witness the birth of your future. Behold the awesome might of the difference engine. Again, probably he didn't use exactly those words, but he might have done. Uh, if you read Babbage's memoirs, it, I wouldn't be surprised if he did say things like that. He was a strange man. Uh, and here we have the punchline. Uh, curses, it's jammed. Uh, one of the problems with the, the analytical and difference engines is because they were mechanical, they would be prone to mechanical failures, like just jamming physically. The thing is, Babbage actually designed it to try and deal with that. Um, he was worried about the fact that there are various sort of mechanical failures that would cause the thing to produce wrong answers. You know, like a cog would switch to the next cog by mistake, and now, now you're back to square one, now you're back to you've got mistakes in your tables. So he tried to put in fail-safes, where if ever anything kind of went out of calibration, it would just lock up rather than making a mistake. And that is sort of what happens today when a program crashes. Right? When a program crashes, what's usually happening is you've referenced some memory address that you don't have access to, and the operating system identifies that and says, well, that can't possibly be right, and it terminates the process. The idea sort of being that that will do less damage than to let you keep running away doing terrible wrong things to the computer. So, uh, and so I say Babbage's machine was sort of designed to, to jam as a, a defense mechanism against error. So it wasn't a bug, it was a feature. And uh, gently reversing the engine was one... Uh, have you tried turning it off and on again, of course, the, the universal fix? And indeed, gently reversing it and trying it again was one way to get out of the jammed state. Or you could hit it with a crowbar, which is something that, much as you, you might be tempted, you shouldn't try with modern machines. Uh, it, it, it works in a certain narrow sense, but it's not a good long-term strategy. OK, so that's, uh, that's Babbage and Lovelace. Uh, if you're interested in that kind of thing, um, this is Sydney's website where she has a bunch of these cartoons. In fact, she compiled them into, well, the origin is a nice one. This is the, uh, just again, show you what it looks like. This is, uh, here we go, um, another attempt to do the, the origin story. Uh, this is the, she, uh, Sydney was actually connected to the Ada Lovelace Day thing, which started some time ago. And uh, there's some nice st stuff in here about her personality and how things came to be. You can read yourself if you want. Um, there's also a book. 
she published a, a, a proper decent sized book that's full of these cartoons about uh, Babbage and Lovelace. And they're funny, but they're all true in the sense that they are like, you know, they try to be based on sort of the historical reality. And there's some quite good stuff in there. Um, it's a, I think it's a very good book. Unfortunately, uh, the book has got an error in it. On page 230, she tries to explain binary arithmetic and gets it wrong. <laughs> so obviously I sent her an email, uh, explained the situation. She was very nice about it. And I think it's maybe been fixed in more recent printing. So I've got the first edition of the thing. Um, so uh, but anyway, it's a good book. I, I do recommend it. Uh, and wh while we're on the topic of uh, Babbage, um, You'll, you'll notice occasionally I will throw videos into these lectures to try and just kind of break up the dry bits a little bit. And they're often kind of a bit silly or, or supposedly humorous. Um, so this is an example of that. This is a real, this is a piece of real information about Babbage's machine, but it's done by uh, a woman called Philomena Kunk. Does anyone know Philomena Kunk? I'm not sure if she's made it to Iceland. So she's a fake TV presenter. Right? She's actually a, a comedian. She's an actress called Diane Morgan. But she does these things for the BBC where she plays the part of this kind of slightly dopey interviewer. She's like a parody of bad science documentaries, right? And this is her uh, from a one that is about, I think it's about the, like the, yeah, the history of Britain as a whole. And this is the section where she's talking about Charles Babbage. She's talking to a real bona fide expert on Babbage who was involved in the attempts to rebuild or to, to build Babbage's machines in the 90s using to recreate them using old technology just to see if it would have worked. And it would. They, they managed to rebuild them. The, the designs were good. And this is her talking to him and being an idiot. The Industrial Revolution was so frenetic, a man called Charles Babbage got carried away and invented the computer far too early. Modern computers are tiny, but this was as big as a transit van. It was even bigger than the 1990s one your dad's got in the loft and won't throw away in case the bin men find all his bank details and mucky JPEGs. Hello, who are you? I'm Doran Swade. I'm an historian of computing and I was responsible for building this engine. So what games does it have? It doesn't have any games. It must have like some basic games like Mario Kart or Snake Car. I'm afraid or not. Or Patience, like the shittest one. It must have Patience. I'm afraid it doesn't. It doesn't have any games. None whatever. It just does mathematical calculations. So where's the screen on this computer? A screen, again, is part of the electronic era. This has no screens. As it happens, you don't need to read the numbers because it prints them automatically for you. It's a shame, isn't it, that it doesn't have a screen? Because then you could turn it upside down and it'd, the numbers would become rude words. You know, like with a calculator? Yes. Have you ever done that? I haven't, but I know what you mean. You've done this, but you haven't done that. Correct. <laughs> So there you go. That was a Babbage's difference engine. Does it have any games? Uh, well, Babbage's engine didn't run games. And indeed, within his lifetime, it didn't run at all because he, he didn't get around to finishing it. But it is striking that from that quote that Ada mentioned earlier about how computers could potentially deal with you know, music and pictures, she is considered to be sort of the, the first person to have had that insight that computers could be more than mere calculators that they could be extended to these other things. Um, now, if you're actually interested in, in, in Ada and the details, the famous paper she wrote was called Sketch of the Analytical Engine. And there are a couple of versions of it online, and this is the cleanest one I've been able to find. It's, it's actually it's pretty technical, um, but again, if you're interested or at some point you, you, know, you find yourself wanting to understand where computers, computer science started from, you can have a go at it. Again, it's written in high Victorian, and there'll be things in it that maybe won't make a lot of sense to you, but it's her attempt to go through it. She explains the, the basic mathematical principles behind some of the uh, the way it worked, the, the way the difference engine worked to begin with, which is all about this stuff. Um, and it goes on, you know, it's quite long, uh, but it's, and this is the beginning of a program, by the way. This is like, this is a simple program to think, solve a simultaneous equation or something like that. Yeah, I think so. Um, so here it is, if you want to have a look at it, get some idea as to where the whole field began. Also, the famous thing about this paper is that the first part of it is her translation of uh, some notes that were written up by a guy who had been to a conference where Babbage was explaining the machine. So the first part of it is her translating someone's write-up of things that Babbage said. right? But then the famous part is there are notes afterwards, and the notes are con conventionally described as being three times longer than the paper. I think they're actually only twice as long, really. But um, 
But she added a bunch of notes that explain in much more detail how the machine was supposed to work. And this is what this is why she has her priority because uh, it's believed that she actually you know wrote this stuff herself and figured it out. In practice, there are debates about whether she did it in collaboration with Babbage, of course, who was definitely he was definitely in on it. But the idea is that it was probably a fairly substantial piece of her own work. So that's that. Uh, and there's some historical info about how it came to be, which again, I would, I would recommend you look at this if you can squeeze it in. Uh, I should point out that you know, generally a course like this with six credits, it's supposed to be, I think it's 15 hours of your time a week or something like that. Uh, and you know, that's supposed to be like a couple hours of contact time with me, some homework time, some reading time. So in theory, because there's no real homework this week other than reading these things, I would say you should try and allow yourself a few hours to just go through have a have a skim over these things at least to get a rough idea about them, and if there are ones that really interest you, you can dig in. Okay. Um, yes. So I've got some material here. What I normally do is I, I go into this section in the tutorial sessions, uh, and I'll skip it just now because it, it takes a bit of time, and I want to get a bit of forward momentum. So I'm going to press Escape to zoom out, and I'm going to skip forward, and then come back in. Now, I don't know if we're going to get a tutorial this week because the scheduling is up in the air, right? I'm hoping that we do. What I like to do is get a tutorial session on like Wednesday afternoon. Uh, in fact, my preference is instead of three lectures back to back, which is what we've been scheduled today, I prefer to do two lectures on a Monday, one lecture on a Wednesday, followed by the tutorial. And that I found is like a good balance, but we'll just need to see what happens. Um, so for the time being, I'll skip that tutorial part and I'll just jump forward 100 years from Babbage which, although it was interesting work, it was historically kind of a dead end because they didn't build it and it was mechanical and it would have been very expensive and it would have been slow. Uh, and we'll jump forward to when practical computers emerged. And practical computers, practical computers actually emerged around World War II. And uh, it's not just a coincidence. Uh, there, was a, there was a reason for it. There were things during the war that people wanted to calculate and they needed ways to calculate them more quickly than the humans could do it. So there was a whole bunch of things were invented in the, the 40s. In fact, one of them, does anyone know Conrad Zuse? One guy, okay. My, my, my grandfather bought a painting of his. Wow. Uh, which, my, which, which I have. You've got a painting by Conrad Zuse? Yeah. Can I come to your house and look at it? <laughs> uh, that's amazing. So this is really, so Conrad Zuse is, is kind of getting to the obscure end of things. If you read histories of computing, sometimes he's there and sometimes he's not. Um, basically, you know, people at Turing, you know about Alan Turing, right? Yes, you all heard of him, right? Uh, who was, again, wartime, and you'd know about this. Um, Zusa's not so famous, but Zusa was first. Uh, Zusa was actually probably has priority for building practical-ish modern computers, and he was doing it as early as 1941. Um, there's a reason we don't hear too much about him, and that's because he was a baddie. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a German and possibly a Nazi, although whether he, it's always hard to know how much people were really collaborating or not. But so Zuse was actually working on computer technology in Germany, uh, back, right through the 30s, in fact. Um, as luck would have it, Hitler wasn't a big fan of computers, so he didn't invest heavily in them, which turns out to have been fortunate because uh, it allowed the British to do it instead. And that's how we won. Um, but Conrad, the, the, the work technically was interesting. So he was an early computer using uh, relays or mechanical switches was what he based his thing on. Then there was another one, uh, a Tanisov Berry computer, which was a special purpose machine for solving simultaneous equations. Then there was Colossus. Have you heard of Colossus? That's the kind of semi-famous ones. This is the one that the British built during the war to help do code cracking. Uh, the conventional story was, is was it was to crack Enigma. There's actually some details there. There were, there were multiple different cipher systems that they built machines for, but roughly speaking, this was the British wartime effort to find a way to crack the, the Nazi codes uh, that is considered to have been a significant contribution to the war effort, probably shortened the war by, people sometimes say, by a year or something like that. Uh, then over in America, they had the Harvard Mark I. It was also based on relays, interestingly enough. Uh, remember, this is this is a, an age where it was things were built out of relays or what British people call valves, um, and Americans call them, uh, they just call them tubes. Yeah, Americans call them thermionic tubes or something. British people call them valves. It's the same thing. It's like those old kind of glass cylinder things that computers used to be made of. Uh, another famous one, the ENIAC. So these are all a bunch of kind of broadly speaking World War II era technologies that were being developed. And these different machines have all got various claims to fame. You know, 
some of them can say, oh, you know, this was the first one that had a stored program or this was the first one that, you know, was general purpose. Or this, there are various kind of competing claims about their merits. And there's a, a Wikipedia article that lets you find out more about them. And then finally, we get to the one that I'm very fond of, uh, a machine that was made in Manchester and nicknamed the Baby. Uh, and it was a little bit later, 1948, before it came along. But what's interesting about the Manchester Baby is that, in fact, was the first one that is is a is the kind of modern style of computer where the program is stored inside the memory of the machine. A lot of these other ones, you did program them, but you programmed them by plugging in cables at the front. You know, you actually wired like the adder circuit to some other circuit, and you connect it. You kind of legoed it all together with uh, with cables, and that's where the term hard wiring comes from. Or you, you hear about things being hard coded. You know, when you just put like a number in the program for no good reason, it's hard coded. That's a sort of a reference to the idea of like you just you just plug that in with a, a cable. Um, but the Manchester Baby was different. It would read the program into memory, and then it would be uh, fetching instructions from its own memory and doing work on them. That's what's nowadays called the von Neumann architecture, even though von Neumann didn't invent it. He just described it. Uh, anyway, so that's the history there. And this is what the Manchester Baby looks like, or at least a recent reconstruction of it. Um, this is an attempt to, as faithfully as they can, either using original parts or kind of attempts to sort of refurb the original parts, uh, rebuild that machine. And I, I've seen this. Uh, there's a, a technology museum in Manchester where you can go and see it, and they sometimes have little demos where they try and operate it. And this central thing here is the uh, the, the display device, uh, which is a tiny cathode ray tube. You know, the things that TVs used to be made of before they became flat. Yeah, those. Um, that's the Manchester baby. Uh, now, here's a great thing. Now, this might, uh, thing is, I might have to log into Facebook to make this work, but um, this is a, a great video I found from 1949 of the BBC filming the Manchester baby uh, doing a calculation. So I will just switch the screen off for a second in case I have to type in secret things. Uh, but that won't work because it'll be in the recording anyway. Ha 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 ha. Okay, I'm not going to do that. Let me just see what happens if I try and open the link. It may or may not work. Oh, I go away. Right. Okay, let's see if we can... Come on. Switch that off. Manchester University, where anyone who urgently wishes to know whether 2 to the power of 127 minus 1 is a prime number or not, can be given the answer by an electronic brain in 25 minutes instead of by a human brain in six months. <laughs> Setting the machine for this kind of problem takes a week. Then the brain is switched on and impulses passing to the computer make the actual calculation. The computer itself contains 1,500 valves. The brain at present is only in the experimental stage, the answer being read from a cathode ray tube. Later, an automatic keyboard will type the answer. I love that. I really do like these things. Okay, that was great. So that was the early use of a, a post-war computer doing a calculation, uh, a prime test, which is one of the standard like, trial exercises. Uh, it's one of these things that you do. Uh, but what we're interested in in this course is, the, of course, the trivial misuse of computers for uh, games. We're not doing anything serious, like working out whether large numbers are prime or working out what the Germans were planning to do during the war. Uh, we're not doing that. Um, so, yeah, after the, the, Manche the thing with Manchester Baby is that it was kind of a prototype uh, that got turned into a commercial device a few years later called the Ferranti Mark I, and that was one of the first commercially available computers. And it actually ran games. You could play games on the... On, if you had a Ferranti Mark I back in 1951, probably it cost you the equivalent of a million pounds to, to have one. Uh, but if you had it, you could, you could play games. Not very good games, rubbish ones, just like Philomena said. Right? Um, turns out you could actually play chess on it, a really limited form of chess. A guy called Dietrich Prince wrote a, a chess program. From what I rem remember, though, it, actually doing chess well on a computer is quite tricky. It requires quite a lot of memory and processing power. So the version that he wrote was really only good for working out end games. You know, if you only have like a few moves to go and a small number of pieces, it's not quite so hard to work out all the options. So he had a, a little end game simulator that you could in fact play on this machine. And then a, a fairly famous computer scientist called Christopher Strachey wrote a version of Checkers, 
which is also called Drafts. You know what I'm talking about, that game? The, the one where you just hop wee things? Uh, simpler than chess, you see. Uh, so he wrote a version of that, and indeed these ran on the machine. And I think that I think the people like that would just, they would have done that out of interest. And also the kind of test programs, you know, often these things are just ways of saying, well, what can we do? How fast is it? You know, they're just kind of uh, benchmarks in a way. So computer games, in a certain sense, go back quite a long time. You know, it wasn't long after we had them when for people to start uh, putting games on them. However, you know, old-fashioned board games uh, turn each, not the kind of game that you tend to think about nowadays, of course. We think about modern computer games. First of all, they're, you know, they're real-time. They're running at 60 frames a second. There's all sorts of stuff going on. Uh, they've maybe got compl complications like multiplayer and all this kind of thing. Obviously, much more advanced. How long do you think it was before real-time multiplayer games were invented for computers? If we had basic ones in 1950, you think they made it into the 60s, 70s? 70s, yeah. I think it's a reasonable guess. You think, yeah, but maybe by the 70s we could do something that's more like what you think of as a game now. But you maybe know I'm setting you up here, right? <laughs> um, actually, in 1958, uh, the first sort of the first real-time multiplayer computer game was invented. Now, again, there are always caveats with these stories, so here's, here's the story. In 1958, a physicist called William Higginbotham, who had actually worked on the, the, the atom bomb, was working in a lab with a, an analog computer. Now, nowadays, all, all computers are digital, right? But that was not always the case. Uh, instead of all being you know, zeros and ones, you could make computers where you would have, like, the voltages were, you know, within a range, and they would represent a range of numbers, like a measurement. Um, it could be a you know, an analog value, and you could actually add up analog values as well. And that was that was a, a strand of computing early on, which ultimately it lost out to digital. Digital was seen as, you know, ultimately more reliable. Uh, that's basically the, the main the main advantage of digital. But but nevertheless, an analog computer is a computer, and it was being used to compute ballistics trajectories, which a lot of the early computer work was about that. It was calculating firing tables for projectiles and stuff. Um, so anyway, he was asked to come up with something for the visitors' day at the lab. You know, something to impress, like just ordinary people who would come in and would want to see all this stuff that the, their tax money was being spent on, or whatever. Um, so he came up with uh, with this little thing. So he took the the, uh, the analog computer that they had and he wired it up to an oscilloscope. You know what an oscilloscope is? Just like for measuring electrical signals. And uh, and he put some stuff on it and turned it into a simple game, which was a a kind of variant of tennis played on an oscilloscope, and here it is. That's a 1958 ergonomic controller. <laughs> not quite, not quite the Xbox uh, controller, is it? I'm just making this go away. There we go. So I will point something out here that, in addition to this being kind of analog, you also see that it's, it's following a curved trajectory, right? So there's gravity on it. So you've got two pairs side to side, they're hitting a ball, gravity is taking effect. So basically, look, it's, fanci it's fancier than Pong, right? This is, this is Pong with gravity. When they eventually did Pong, there's no gravity, the thing's just to totally linear, you know, very kind of robotic, but it's this nice, you know, curved softness to it. So it's sort of more sophisticated than Pong and done many years earlier. I think that's enough to give you the idea. And that little thing you saw there, the little box, was um, that's a, a relay, if you've never actually seen one. Uh, that's a little uh, electromagnetic switch thing. You put the current through and it pulls a lever down and magnets and stuff. Okay. Um, there's some more info about that whole Tennis for Two thing if you want. Again, I'll just leave you to watch this if you're interested and follow the links.
Oh yeah, this little uh, thing I have to add here. Um, so William, Higgin William Higginbotham is said to have expressed sentiment of regret that he would probably end up being more famous for his uh, invention of a computer game that he made like in a weekend or something, uh, as opposed to what he thought his real life's real life's work was, which was uh, nuclear non-proliferation. Having been involved in uh, the the uh, Manhattan Project and creating the the bomb, obviously a lot of the scientists who did that were concerned about the implications of nuclear weapons in the world. Didn't stop them working on them, uh, but you know uh, afterwards Higginbotham tried to uh, work on ways to stop the spread of nuclear weapons throughout the world. And uh, when he died, there were a sentiment of interest in him because he was one of these sort of pioneers who had died. And in the aftermath of that, his son said that uh, if you're going to talk about Higginbotham, uh, do include information about his non-proliferation work, because that's what he wanted to be remembered for. So I thought I'd put that in just to honour the uh, spirit of that request. OK, so moving forward now into the 60s, you get um, gradually things that are becoming more recognisable as what we call computer games. Uh, so this is a thing called Space War that ran on a digital computer, so that's much more the kind of thing you'd, 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 we'd understand. But it was a, a machine called the PDP-1, which was the kind of machine that used to exist in university labs for computer scientists. Um, and he created a, another little spaceship game where you fly a spaceship about, you thrust the rock, you know, thrust, thrust the engines, and, uh, and you can shoot each other. And there's a black hole in the middle that pulls you in gravitationally. Uh, it's quite nice. And the guy who invented this, Steve Russell, is actually a fairly notable computer scientist. He wrote the first implementation of a, of a language called Lisp. Do you know about Lisp? Yeah. So uh, Lisp is a very historically significant language. In fact, do, do you do Scheme or anything like that? Yeah, so Scheme's a derivative of Lisp, and this is where it all started. Uh, but he didn't write this in Lisp. Uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't do this in Lisp. Uh, anyway, here it is, Space War. And that's Steve himself. That's the guy who, who wrote it. Oh God, I hope I'm right when I say it. I think it is, because I think I know his face. And that's him uh, showing it in a you know, much more recent uh, demo. Uh -huh. So you turn it back on, and it's sitting there, and back to uh -huh. the switch go. Uh -huh. Because the core memory is 16 kilobyte, kilo We have 12 kilowords. 12 kilowords. That was a little bit of that. Um, there's an article here that describes about how it works. It turns out it only needed 9K to run in, 9 kilobytes, which is, you know, not a lot. And in fact, there's an emulator. You can, you can play it on the web here. Um, Again, I'll just open it up to show you that the link uh, works. So here it is. This is the so this is apparently the original code uh, running through emulation, being emulate in, in JavaScript, running an emulator of the old PDP one. Um, it's it turns out it's a ferociously hard game to play, and I would go so far as to suggest that it's maybe not a good game. But <laughs> but nevertheless, you know you have to make allowances. Uh, so that's me thrusting away, thrust, 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 and that is, I'm going to get caught in the hole because I'm. Rubbish. Oh, oh no! Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do find it difficult. It's, maybe it's me. I don't know. But um, I don't think it's the best game in the world. But it's kind of amazing that we can that we can do it at all. Uh, maybe I should be trying and actually killing my opponent. But it's a, a great um, great thing about emulation that you can take something that was originally written in the early 1960s for a totally obscure dead machine doesn't exist anymore, and like the instructions for that machine are now being emulated. Inside JavaScript, which is this, you know, terrible, slow toy scripting language running inside a web browser with like huge layers of inefficiency between it and the real hardware, and it all it, it works somehow amazingly. Okay, right. So that was uh, so. Space War was just, you know, a, a game program running on a computer that was in a research lab. Uh, which is, I mean, that's kind of what we do now. But, you know, computers are general purpose, and games are just one of the things you do with them. But there was also a period where there were specialised 
uh, video game machines that were uh, invented and, and manufactured. And that kind of goes back to the late 60s for a guy called Ralph Bayer. Um, created a, a, an electronic device that was basically a, a circuit that he'd made. It wasn't a full computer. So that there's, the, there's a question here about computer games versus video games, right? Um, if you want to make a distinction, video games would refer to games that produce, you know, video images as their output. So it's a thing you could like, you could wire it up to a TV and you'd have like a video signal, right? The thing is, you don't need a computer to do that. A computer is one way of doing it, but you can also just create like an electronic circuit. You know, just build it out of transistors and resistors, and you create a in the same way you create a thing that create, generated a test card signal or something. You just build a device that did it, and that's how the brown box worked. The brown box wasn't a computer as such. It was basically a custom electronics thing, but it generated video images that were intended to be interpreted as games. And here he is in 1968 with uh, a game that you might recognise. Okay, let's skip ahead. So see that? You see it curved? You notice that? There's a, there was a thing on it that, that uh, Bayer called English, which is the term that Americans use to describe like, swerving on a cue ball when they're playing snooker or pool. They call it English, and English people call it side. Uh, so the point is that um, although mostly the, the, the Pong thing would move linearly, you could put a swerve on it. Uh, so you actually see that as part of this clip, if you, if you watch it carefully enough. Yeah, yeah. Which I think is cheating, basically, but that was, go, that, was, go, that, was that, was that was part of the original game. And that's one that, that was not reflected in the, the famous version of Pong that you all know didn't have that. So again, uh, the Higginbotham version had gravity and was sort of nice and analog. The Ralph Bayer version had the swerve thing, and the commercial Pong from the 70s was actually simpler than either of those. So anyway, that was what he did. Um, I should also point out that that the, the brown box thing got commercialised into a product called the Magnavox Odyssey. So you could actually buy this in the 70s. And as I say, it wasn't really a full computer. It was more an electronic gizmo that could play a huge variety of very, very different games. They were all the same game. Um, you can see that it's pretty obvious that basically this was just an electronic circuit for playing Pong with a couple of optional switches you could put in it that would make it be slightly different in some ridiculous way. And the funny thing is about the Magnavox thing, in order to try and trick you into believing that it was more than one game, they would provide different backgrounds for each game. Now, how did they do the backgrounds? The backgrounds were pieces of cellophane that came in the box that you stuck on your television <laughs> when you were playing the game. And that was to make it so, oh, now it's ice hockey. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's how it worked. Magnavox presents Odyssey, the electronic game of the future. Odyssey easily attaches to any brand TV, black and white or colour, to create a closed circuit electronic playground. <laughs> it's definitely not just Paul. Hockey ...and 11 other challenging play and learning games for the entire family. <laughs> Odyssey, a new dimension for your television. Now at your Magnavox dealer. He's listed in the yellow pages. The other great con about the Odyssey is they, they sold these games as little cartridges that you'd plug in for all the different games, right? Just like the, you know, the way the Nintendo used to be, of cartridges. Um, great business model. The thing is, the cartridges didn't do anything. All those cartridges did is they activated some switches at the bottom of the box that were already there. So you bought your game, 
you know, and paid proper money for it, and all it did is it depressed a couple of dip switches inside the circuit to make it be the, the very slightly different version of Pong that it was supposed to be. You know, maybe change the speed or something like that. And that was all it was, just, just set a bunch of switches. But of course, the, the thing is that you could charge decent money for each new game, even though they were just like a piece of, piece of plastic that cost nothing. And that would allow you to make the original, the, the main device could be sold at a cheaper price to kind of lure people in. And games consoles have worked this way ever since. A lot of games consoles are sold for less than they cost to make, but they get their money back because you buy the games. But that's why the company that sells the hardware also owns the games, because they need to get their cut of the games to compensate for the fact that they sold you the machine for cheaper than it cost them to build it. Uh, the, the economies of uh, games consoles are weird that way. It's the same economy, isn't it, but you left it with razor, razor blades. Yes, yeah, like, like razors and razor blades, yes. There's a lot of these weird economic things where you try and reduce the initial outlay for people and then you get them on the resale. Or uh, printer ink, I think is the other one. For, yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's, uh, that's how that worked. Uh, and there we go, there's, there's Ralph Byer, who, who died in uh, 2014. But, you know, he had a, he had a decent innings. Yeah, what's that? Left to be 92. That's not too bad a high score. Um, okay, so that was a little bit of a detour because that wasn't really a computer. The, the, those, those things were a bit of a special case. But if we go back to uh, now the arcade coin ops that you're maybe starting to have more cultural memory of that uh, developed in the 70s, and they were based on computers. They were you know, programmable devices. Um, yep, so in the 70s... Um, a guy called Nolan Bushnell decided to make a, a video game machine and he called his company Atari and they made a game that was called Pong. So this is the famous version of Pong that, that, that we know from the 70s, which obviously wasn't a rip-off of anything, mm -hmm. except it was. There, have been, there were lawsuits uh, after the fact suggesting that Nolan Bushnell had in fact seen Tennis for Two uh, back in the old days or he knew about Ralph Bayer's uh, brown box. So there were lots of kind of legal wranglings as to who who would, you know, entitled to the, the original rights to the idea of Pong. Uh, and then after Pong, another famous one a few years later was called Breakout. You know, do you know about Breakout? Yeah. Again, it's one, the, 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 the wall rows of bricks and you hit it from below, that one. Um, if, if you think about it, uh, Breakout is, is sort of Pong turned on its side, right? Because with Pong, you're like here and the ball's going that way and you say, well, turn it round and have the bats go this way and the ball between and then the other bat, instead of being a, a player, you just turn it into a bunch of bricks. So it uh, becomes a one player game. So it's kind of like turn Pong on its side and make it single player. Uh, and that's what Breakout was. There's some interesting history to Breakout. Um, he hired a, an eager young fellow called Steve Jobs and asked him to design and build the electronics for this, uh, for this idea that he had. And again, the, the, breakout, the original breakout wasn't a general purpose computer. Again, it was a special circuit that was just designed to just, just do breakout. Uh, and if you know anything about Steve Jobs, you'll, you'll know what happened next. Do you, though? Do you? Uh, what happened next was he got Steve Wozniak to do it, as usual. Because <laughs> Steve Wozniak was the actual genius, you know, the guy who like, knew about programming and electronics and stuff. Um, I mean, I've been a bit unkind, but I mean it as well. Uh, so Steve Wozniak was kind of the, the real techie guy behind Apple in the early days. And indeed, it seems to be the case that Jobs got the contract to make Breakout and then got Wozniak to actually build the damn thing. Uh, and that's how the world works. <laughs> I'm not better, though. Um, I mean, I didn't invent anything that turned out to be amazingly lucrative and I didn't get any of the money for it. Um, Okay, so after that little uh, detour, we finally get onto CPU-based coin op. So this is when instead of making special case things like it, you know, it was just a just a, a circuit for breakout. What you did instead is you had a general uh, microprocessor that could do anything, and you wrote a program for it, and the program made it be breakout or pong or whatever you wanted it to be, and that's how games work now. You know, we don't actually build custom circuitry anymore, apart from in very special cases. Um, so this is just what happened in the, in the course of the, the 70s. The, the microprocessor got developed and refined until you could buy them fairly cheaply. Uh, people, companies at Intel started making them, and then you could use that as the central thing that you would build your game around, your game hardware around. And the classic example of that would be Space Invaders. You all know Space Invaders, right? Surely, yes. Um, it turns out apparently Space Invaders was basically made by one guy who designed the game, did the art, the sounds, the whole thing and apparently did some customization to the electronics of it, but basically the, the underlying electronics was like a standard 
uh, circuit using a microprocessor and some standard memory and all this kind of thing, but he customized it a bit to make it uh, do what he needed it to do. Um, if you go into details here, you can see that this was it was actually based on a an electronic board that Midway created. Um, some details here about it. Is that the right link? Yeah, there's some stuff in there about it if you really want to know. Uh, using a, an Intel 8080 processor, that's like a, just a very early version of the modern Intel chips in a sense, running at a massive 2 megahertz. Remember nowadays we think in gigahertz, right? Mm -hmm. A megahertz is like a thousand times less than that. And not only that, but the instructions were much simpler and the memory was slower. And this was all 8-bit, not 64-bit. So these things were literally tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of times less, uh, less raw computing power than we have nowadays. And it, was, it was hard to make things work on machines like that. Um, so that was Space Invaders. Also, another one called. Oh, yeah? So Question? It's true that in Space Invaders, the reason why the aliens go faster is because of the three sub processing power is still more than. So, so the question there was is it true that in Space the, in space Invaders, towards the end, the baddies get faster simply because there's less work to do because there are fewer baddies? Um, I cannot swear it to you, but that sounds familiar to me, and that would be true that without. If you didn't go out of your way to prevent it, it would naturally be the case that as there were fewer aliens left to update, it would take less time to update the frame. So you could see that the frames would get faster. Uh, this is a this is something that comes up in real games. It's sort of called frame rate compensation, where you have to try and make sure that you know what, what you don't want is scenes in the game where there's a lot going on. The game gets really slow because there's too much work to do, and you'll see that sometimes in a game. Um, and there are things you have to do to try and like even that out. It's, to me, it's, it's totally possible that Space Invaders gets fast at the end as a consequence of that. Yes, that might be true. Um, okay, let's have a look at Asteroids. Uh, do, you know, do you know about Asteroids? Is that still a well-known game? Yeah. Asteroids is interesting because most of the other games we've seen use kind of pixel graphics, you know, like little dots. But Asteroids are based on lines. There's a slightly different technology. So these lines are not actually made of pixels, as we would understand them. They're, uh, it's a, a special type of... Um, electron gun that can actually literally draw lines on the screen and that's how asteroids was made anyway so that's a nice little game all right so we're, this is almost as far as I'll go. I, I'm not going to do like the, the super modern developments in computing, most of which I think you know. I just wanted to deal with these embryonic phases up to the 80s, which is when I started paying attention. Um, so I think this is basically the last one that I'll talk about just now, and that's Pac-Man, another, um, you know, obviously historically very significant game. It was like Pac-Man was a huge deal. You know, it was like a huge uh, pop culture phenomenon when it happened. So that was 1980. And it was based on an old processor called the, the Zilog Z80. And it was running at, again, an amazing 3 megahertz. It had a 16 kilobyte ROM. I mean, these numbers are so small compared to modern ideas, you know. Um, only a couple of kilobytes of RAM and a couple of kilobytes of video memory as well. Very low resolution, just hundreds of pixels, not the thousands that we have now. And all sorts of restrictions, like, a, the, you know, you, you couldn't use all the colors. You only had, like, a a small set of available colors, lots of these things that had to be worked around, like only four colors per object and stuff, really quite restrictive. So it's, it's kind of impressive how much they were able to do on very primitive and restricted hardware back in the day. And of course, these programs were all written directly in machine code or assembly language. You know, these weren't written in C or anything like that. It'd be too slow. You couldn't do it. You had to write this using machine level instructions. So it's like, you know, load this memory from this address, add it to this one, write it out here. If it's less than zero, go here. Just pages and pages of this crap. And that was the way it had to be done. Uh, so the other thing that happened around this period, where we had the, these developments in the arcades, you also started to have the, the home consoles that were based on computers. You know, the early ones that I mentioned that were just gizmos, not real computers, but you started to get real computers in the home for games purposes. And basically the famous one of those was the Atari VCS that later be called, became called the Atari 2600. It turns out there was one there was one that preceded it called the Fairchild Channel F, but that wasn't so successful. So the 2600 is the one that people know about. So this was basically the first home computer system that you could buy, the home computer game system that you could buy. Uh, and it actually came out in 1976. 
a little bit earlier than Pac-Man. And here are the specs for it. It only ran at 1 megahertz in a bit. Uh, again, an 8-bit processor. Only 2K of ROM. Crappy resolution. Uh, total, total memory in the thing, 128 bytes of RAM. 128, not kilobytes, bytes. 128 bytes of RAM. In fact, it's so little RAM that you tend to think of it in bits. It was 1,024 bits. That's less than a tweet, right? The whole RAM in the system, the whole the whole game RAM had to be stored in less space than one goddamn tweet. Um, and if you want to know about it, you can actually read the programmer's guide to that. Uh, the the 2600 is an amazing piece of hardware. It's like it's super primitive, but it's fascinating, and all sorts of clever tricks were required to make it do anything at all. Um, in fact, you see this 128 bytes of memory, right? It's so small, it's not enough memory to store the screen. <laughs> so it didn't. It didn't know what was on its own screen. The way it worked is it had to draw the screen line at a time as you were watching it. Like the way old, old TVs work, that the electron gun would, would draw the screen line at a time. What was happening on the VCS is it was computing those dots as they were being drawn in, in, in sync with the refresh on, the, on, the, on your TV because it couldn't store them anywhere because it had no memory. And it was, it's hard to make it do anything. Uh, which is why a lot of the games were rubbish. <laughs> um, and and by way of illustration, um, I've got a little video here that I think I can justify showing to you. Um, that's uh, Conan O'Brien uh, actually playing some old games from the 2600. And when you watch this, um, obviously you can laugh at it because, you know, they're lame and everything, right? But when you bear in mind a one megahertz machine with a couple of hundred uh, bytes of memory uh, and no screen buffer... The, the actual work that was required to do to make any of these games was, was really quite uh, demanding. The people who made these games were really quite skilled, even though the results were not always what we would think of as brilliant by modern standards. So here you go. Hey, Conan O'Brien here with a vintage edition of Clueless Gamer, and I'm here with my pal, Aaron Blair. Hello. We've pretty much played many of the cutting edge modern games. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm routinely am terrible. That's true. <laughs> and yes. contemptuous of the medium. <laughs> and we are going to look at some of the classic Atari video games. Is that right? That's right. We're doing kind of a, a throwback episode and we're going to see how it all started. The Atari 2600 is kind of the grandfather of all video games. I thought this was a, a grill, a George Foreman grill. <laughs> I'm glad you told me because I was just about to put two hamburger patties down there and start grilling. Now, quickly show me the video game controllers that we've been using. Yeah. All the games I've reviewed, pretty much, yes. have been with this incredibly sophisticated control system. But let's step back in time. Look at this. Yeah. This looks like the defibrillator they used on Elvis. <laughs> just, just checking out. We're going to play a lot of games today, but the game that came with the uh, Atari 2600 was called Combat. It came with a, a booklet. This smells like the mid seventies. <laughs> this smells like Stevie Nicks. <laughs> so just, so shove just... It, shove it in there. Okay. And then flip on the power. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you're just gonna try to kill me. You're the blue Which tank. My, I'm the blue tank. Yep. <laughs> you can barely tell that's a tank. It looks vaguely sexual. <laughs> when people played this for the first time, they thought this was the most amazing thing that ever happened, right? Yes, exactly. This, their minds were blown. There's nothing here that's remotely tanked. I should say that one, one of the objectives in this course is, that at the end, for you to be able to make games that are better than this. That's, that's what we're aiming for. It's a high bar, but well, let's see if we can do it. Like, all right, I now know why everyone was high back then. <laughs> the only way to make these games exciting. This is dreadful. <laughs> Let's put it on watch paint dry. <laughs> All right, now we're gonna look at Missile Command, another Atari game that promises much more than it can deliver with the cover art. <laughs> Aliens from the planet of Crystal have begun an attack on the planet Zardon. The Praetolians have begun fight. It's so sad that someone had to write this. And you know what? We know we're about to see three blips. And it prepared me for, oh, there we go, yeah? Those are Zardonians and Krytolians, all right. What do I do? So you move the dash around. Yeah, so the colored circles knock out the blips. Well, okay, uh, while you were explaining it to me, my, I lost my city. But you know what? This city looks like shit, so I don't care. At the time, what's really scary yeah. is this was about... 
the sophistication of the computer that controlled all our nuclear missiles. The Russians probably saw these games and thought, we should attack now. <laughs> these are dreadful, absolutely dreadful, but we're moving on to golf. There's a nice depiction on the front of what I think is Senator Robert Kennedy. <laughs> and then we're gonna see how it's depicted here. All right, ready? In this game. Oh, God. <laughs> Look at that savage world. What's happening now? Is that a human being? <laughs> I hope he's holding a golf club. <laughs> or else he's a perv. Look at his movement, so fluid, so golf-like. <laughs> What a horrible era for mankind. I can go and look at an old butter churn or a turn of the century yeah, car, totally. and I can appreciate the beauty of it. Absolutely. I can look at a, a 1950s Bakelite phone, and it still works, and it's very beautiful. Yeah. This is awful. <laughs> this is just America on its knees. Uh, here we go. River Raid. River Raid. Here we go. What am I on? What is this? I don't even know you're what I'm on. You're, you're plane. Oh, I'm a plane. Uh, and I'm going over a you river? Can... <laughs> when I drift to the side, I shouldn't be smashing into the bank of the river, right? Right. So I don't understand where I am in time and space. I don't know. Am I in the air? Yeah. Where am you're I? You're a plane. Where am I? I don't know. You're... I'm a plane. You're... What is this? River. Oh. River Raid. River Raid. River Raid! <laughs> this may be the worst day of my life. So this is actually one of the most popular games that Atari had. It's called Pitfall. Pitfall. Look, this is the genius behind this game right here. Which was taken shortly before he snapped and murdered everyone in his condo. All right, so here we go. That's me. Yep. Oh, whoa. Boom. And then, what am I supposed to do oh, there? Yeah. Oh, nothing, that's a log. You're just supposed to jump up. That's bad. I'm going this way. OK, well, and do you want to jump on that? I don't even know what I'm doing. That's the one direction in the whole game is, look at that. That's not supposed to help us. What's next? We, uh, space Invaders? Remember Space Invaders? This game? Oh, right. I just dodge what they're doing and fire. Is that right? That's it. You know what? This is actually an okay game though, still. Here we go. This is a game. And I'm actually playing it, and I know what I'm doing. We found my game. Space Invaders, yes. Awesome. Still holds up. So we had a poll online yeah. where fans could choose right. what game they wanted to see you play. Okay. They chose this. E.T. the Extra Terrestrial. <laughs> now here's the thing about E.T. It's widely regarded as the worst video game of all time. Worse than the golf? <laughs> really? Uh-oh. E.T.? Yeah. Okay, so you... E.T. is coming down in an elevator. Yeah. The elevator's just left him in a swamp. Where am I going? I'm just, he's just pacing nervously. <laughs> and who's that guy? I think he's the FBI agent. Don't okay. let him touch you. If you see a man in a trench coat, never let him touch you. <laughs> that is a piece of your telephone. The whole point of this game is to collect three pieces of your telephone, then call your spaceship, and it comes back to rescue you. Okay, now go up. Now you're flying. Oh, and his neck is flying. Yeah. Okay, uh, now, now you fell in the, in the hole. Yeah, so I got another piece of my telephone. Yeah, well, the, well that's a flower. So you hit the thing and the flower will go up. There you go, you made the flower go up. <laughs> Why would I make the flower go? What's the point of that? I think it was in the movie. I don't think... I don't remember. Oh, right, you fell in another hole. You just got to do the neck thing and get out. So there's a lot of just falling in a hole and then extending my neck and float, floating. <laughs> that's basically the whole game. This just simulates the, the cycles of depression. <laughs> The sound effects are fantastic. Listen. <laughs> this is the one the fans wanted me to play? Yeah. Thank you, fans, <laughs> for having me experience that. The fans asked me to play E.T. the Extraterrestrial. Let me rate it. If Flock of Seagulls uh, is good, and Duran Duran is bad, I'm gonna give this a man at work. Figure it out. I did like Space Invaders. It was a fun game for me to play. It took me back uh, to a time when I was about to lose my virginity. It was a thrilling experience for me. Yeah. It this was means a lot to me. Let's never do this again. <laughs>
Okay. Um, by the way, the guy who wrote E.T. was actually a good programmer. He'd made some other good games, but the E.T. thing, he had to like, do that in six weeks or something. And remember, he's writing this entirely in assembly language. Is there a question? Can you bury all the unsold copies? So, so the question was about the, the burial of the unsold copies. Um, there has long been a myth, or was it a myth, this idea that the, the thing about E.T. is they thought it was going to be a huge hit because of a big franchise, so they made lots of, you know, made like a million copies. They didn't sell very well. And the rumour is that the unsold copies ended up being having to be buried in a big landfill somewhere. And this was like a, is it true, is it not true thing in computer game lore for ages until eventually, I think within the past five or ten years, they found it. It's true. Yeah, they actually did it. There's, there's a documentary we made about it where they found the dump out the back of the Atari site or somewhere, you know, someplace somewhere. And they actually found the cartridges, lots of them buried. And so, yeah, they really did just bury them because they didn't sell. Um, and it's a really, it's a sad and strange story. And like I said, the guy who wrote it was not an idiot. He was a perfectly capable guy, but he was working to a ridiculous deadline um, under like just really unfair pressure. Um, and it turns out, I think that was, I think he made a couple of games after that, but he left the industry not long afterwards, became a psychologist uh, or a psychiatrist maybe. And he's actually written a book about that this whole thing about his title is like, is like, is it how I destroyed the computer games industry or something? <laughs> um, I haven't read it, although I, I would like to, because it, it sounds like he's a, he's an interesting guy. I'm gonna, I'll try and read that book one day. Uh, but there we go. Okay, so now normally in the first week I do three lectures. We've had two so far, and I do a third one about a thing called Moore's Law. But this has been a long session, and we're actually we're running a bit late and so on. And I don't want to tire you out. I appreciate you coming and under these short short notice. So I think what we'll do is I'll skip the Moore's Law one in the hope that we maybe get a lecture slot midweek or I'll try and fit it in once the, once the calendar gets properly organised. So we'll just we'll fill that one in later. So I appreciate your patience for turning up and sitting through all this nonsense today uh, and hopefully we can kind of get properly rolling with things later in the week or next week. So thanks for coming. Bye.